be here. Good to have everybody with us. It's, a, it's a especially good to be here. I was in the, in the emergency room last Sunday morning at this time, and I thank the good Lord that uh, I'm here today. And Father, I pray that you bless the study of your word. Lord, that you give me wisdom in scripture. I give the folks ears to hear and a heart that's receptive to scripture. I pray your blessing today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'm going to pick up again today about Satan. <coughs> We've talked about Lucifer, and now we're going to talk a little bit about Satan. And uh, turn to 1 Chronicles, chapter number 21, verse 1. First Chronicles 21, 1. The scripture said, Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. All right, now this is not an evil influence. This is an individual. This is a person. And, uh, of course, the person is Satan. The Hebrew word Satan means adversary. And it means someone who's coming against you. Now, when he first shows up in the Bible, you'll find him over here in the book of Genesis. And you'll find it in Genesis chapter number 3 and verse 1. And what you find here, it says, The serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. You say, well, now, that's not, uh, it doesn't say this is Satan. It doesn't use the term Satan. No, it doesn't. But the Apostle Paul in, uh, in, the, uh, in the book of uh, uh, first, uh, first Thessalonians, let's see. I'll find the reference for you in just a moment. Uh, where he uh, tempted Eve. Here it is, over here. 2 Corinthians 11, 3. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter number 11 and verse number 3. What you find here now is the New Testament commenting on the Old Testament. And when you get this, always take the Bible over uh, so-called scholarship when it comes to interpreting the Scripture. Let me tell you this about the scholars, folks. I've probably got 50 commentaries in the Bible, and I've read this past week, I've probably put uh, at least 20 hours of uh, study uh, reading what these men have to say, and I guarantee you one thing, they don't agree with each other. They don't agree with each other. They don't. So if you, if they ever, if, if some liberal comes across with the idea and says, well now, you know, the progressive liberal believes this, hogwash. They don't agree with each other. And don't ever let any uh, one of them tell you that there's a consensus among these people about what this means or that means. So what you do is let the Bible interpret the Bible. And that's the best thing to always to do. 2 Corinthians 11.3, the scripture says, uh, let me see, chapter number 11. I don't have my, my head's not in gear yet. 2 Corinthians 11.3, here we go. But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. All right, now, who do you think he's making reference to here? A man? Of course not. There's no human being alive in the garden that's alive at the time the apostle wrote this. That's impossible. He's talking about a spirit being. And he, of course, is talking about uh, Satan uh, deceiving Eve. Now, remember what I told you about Lucifer. I said that Lucifer and uh, Sophia and Christ are considered by the Gnostics and many of the like Plato, the monad, you know, Plato taught that uh, there is a one spirit, a one essence of spirit, and that uh, this essence of spirit permeates the creation, and that this spirit emanates itself in different ways. Three of the main ways is as Lucifer, light bearer, as Christ, the anointed, and as Sophia, wisdom. And when you take light, anointing, and wisdom, you have everything that's necessary to uh, make a communication between this spirit being and the creation. And, of course, the Gnostics were big on this because they felt like that they were receiving a 
a uh, initiation into a knowledge that none of the rest of us have. And that's, of course, is why we call them Gnostics, from the Greek word gnosis, which means to know. An agnostic negates gnosis, and it means I don't know. So when someone says, I don't know if there's a God, he's an agnostic. If someone says there is no God, he's an atheist. I am one who believes in God. Amen. And I'm not going to call myself a theist. A theist is one who believes in God, but the problem with a theist is he believes God made it and sit back, and now he's watching it to see what's happening. And God Almighty is in, involved in the affairs of men. Right. But in any event, uh, we know that the manifestation of this emanation throughout time can be found everywhere. Let me give you just a little short trip. Go back to about uh, 1500 B.C., 2000 B.C., and you'll find what's called the Brahman, B-R-A-H-A-M, Brahman. And uh, B-R-A-H-M-A-N, Brahman, I think I've spelled it correctly, but in any event, this arose in what's called the Aryan area of the world, which today would be called India. The Brahmin is an ancient, ancient religion. They're still around. They were the ones who began to develop this idea of the oneness, the monad, and all of this. All right. So from them came a fellow by the name of Gautama Buddha. Buddha is the founder of the Buddhist religion. And Buddhism pulled many parts of Brahmism, but rejected many of the parts of Brahmism. Some of the rejection was that the Brahmins taught that there are many, 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 many hells, and Buddhism denies the existence of hell. Brahmism taught that you could reincarnate yourself through many, 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 many reincarnations to eventually overcome the curse of, of uh, physical reality until you became until you became or became part of what's called nirvana, when you became one in essence with the spirit. Gautama Buddha took that teaching and he, uh, I guess you might say, uh, he, uh, he, he purified it for the Buddhist because Buddhism has reached all over the world. You would be amazed at how many Buddhists are out there in this world. Pythagoras was a Greek philosopher who took Buddhism into the Greek culture, and it also, of course, affected Plato and the teaching of these philosophers. And all of their, 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 their philosophy, their doctrine, their religion is based on Buddhism, like Zoroaster for the Persian, based on Buddhism. And on and on and on you can go. What you'll find is that the whole world, folks, the whole world, either lies in truth or darkness, in light or darkness. And the darkness seems to be controlled by the most part by the idea that man by his own effort and through many reincarnations can, uh, can become uh, a pure spirit being and can shed himself of, uh, of, uh, of the curse of the physical. On the other hand, what's called the Abrahamic religion, and that's what we are today, because Abraham is the father of the faithful. Through that, we understand that man's problem is not a lack of knowledge. Man's problem is sin. And the only way that sin can be dealt with is by a blood sacrifice. And the only blood sacrifice that was ever made that could wipe away the sins of all mankind is the blood sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Redeemer there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Now, if I talked to a Buddhist today and said, you know, you need to be saved, he'd look at me and say, saved from what? I'm saving myself, that I'm living through these, through these karmas and, and reincarnations, and one day I'll, become, I'll reach nirvana, and when I do, I'll become a pure spirit being with the one. So I don't have a problem with sin, the Buddhist would tell me. My problem is that I need to learn through these successive reincarnations. I need to know. I need to grow as a spirit being. And I say to him, your problem is sin, just like my problem is sin, like the problem of every human being on the face of this earth. Their problem is sin, folks. It's not that you don't know enough. The Bible teaches plainly that knowledge puffeth up. And that's, has that been your experience? Absolutely. You get one puffed up with enough knowledge and he'll become condescending, patronizing, 
and he'll come and he will, he will treat you like a lesser being. And that's the issue. So when we come to this issue of Satan, then we come to the idea, well, dualism enters into the picture. So what is dualism? And you all know what yin and yang is, don't you? You know the circle. You know the, all right. These are opposites. Remember that. Dualism is about opposites. It's about white, black, good, bad, uh, hot, cold, however you want to state it. It's about opposites. Dualism teaches, though, therefore, that the one manifests itself in two different ways. In order to have a balance of everything, must be balanced, and it's balanced with dualism. So, instead of saying that Satan is a different being from Lucifer, they say simply Satan is another manifestation of Lucifer. They are both one in the same being. One is the good being, the other one is the bad being. Lucifer is the angel of light. Satan is the devil. He's the, he's, the, he's, the, he's the wicked portion. They admit that there's wickedness in the world, and that's the way they explain it, by saying, by, by the issue, by the idea of dualism. All right? Now, here's the way a Christian explains that. Lucifer and Satan are the same. There is no difference. They're simply different uh, terminology and manifestations of the same being. Satan can transform himself into an angel of light. There's Lucifer, the light bearer. His ministers into ministers of righteousness. There's Lucifer, the light bearer. But on the other hand, we have this wicked devil, Diablos, that's called the devil in the New Testament. All right? There's the bad part. But we understand as Christians that the only true light is the Lord God Himself. And anything apart from that is a false light that leads to deception, darkness, and damnation. The only light there is, is the Lord Jesus Christ. When the Lord Jesus Christ, and the folks, this is important. When Christ came into this world, He is the very essence of the light of Almighty God that shines in darkness that no man can see, that no man can comprehend. And when Christ came out of that light, out of that presence, out of that eternal being, this light came down upon mankind, and that light, which is Christ, will lead mankind back to Almighty God. And there's no other way. And so the light is Christ. For the Gnostic then to tell me he knows something, he's been initiated, he knows something that I don't know, I say back to him, I know the wisdom of God. I know the wisdom of God. What is the wisdom of God? The Lord Jesus Christ. The wisdom of God is a person. The Gnostic comes back to me and he says, I have light that you don't have. And I say back to him, there is only one light, just one, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. So it brings you back, and please follow what I'm saying. It brings you back to every principle that is taught in the Old Testament about righteousness, about faith, about goodness, about, about sacrifice and all these things that are taught in the Old Testament, they all converge on a person. The Lord Jesus Christ is righteousness. He is faith. He is holiness. He is salvation. He is redemption. He is the resurrection and the life. Everything now is a person. And the reason it is a person is because the Lord Jesus Christ is the archegos. He is the captain of our salvation. He is the one, the, the, last ma the second man, the last Adam, who leads us into the future. Everything in the future, folks, that has life is in Christ. Yeah. Now let me say that again. Somehow or another, get a hold of that. Yeah. Everything in the future that has life will be in Christ. Yeah. If it's not in Christ, it is a living death. Yeah. It's the second death. It is an eternal death. It is death and dying day in and day out, day in and day out, an existence that is nothing but death without the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's life. In him was life, and the life was the what? The light of men. So the two go together, life and light. Satan, therefore, is the opposite. He's a deceiver, a liar. John 8, 44, the Bible said, You are of your father the devil, for he was a liar from the beginning. Satan is a liar, a deceiver, He's an antichrist, and he has a religion that has been developed now over thousands of years, and it appeals to people because it appeals to the fallen nature. It does not appeal to their spirit and to their soul. 
as God would open the light to them in John chapter number 16 when he said, When he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. You can always tell which spirit a man has been, uh, uh, has been in, uh, affected by. If he's been affected by the Holy Spirit of God, Christ opens up to him. If he's been affected by the God of this world, Gnosis, Gnosticism, Rosicrucianism, all the other isms that are out there, the religion of Aleister Crowley, the craft, uh, witchcraft, all of them with their own spin and their own take on it is a completely separate thing, completely from the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's only one name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. And that's the name of the Lord Jesus. Now here's something that's said about Satan and that most people gloss over this and don't pay much attention to it. But it's important to understand, Satan is a cherubim. All right. Now, a lot of folks say, well, that's just an angel. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. The reason I say that is, if you remember, I've said to you so many times in here before, an angel is not so much necessarily a created being. An angel could be a very manifestation of God Almighty himself, the angel of the Lord. An angel could be that your angel where your angel doth behold the face of our Father which is in heaven. So when you get into the doctrine of angels, it's not quite as cut and dried and simple as a lot of folks would like to make it to be. But a cherubim is a different creature altogether. A cherub is a created heavenly being. There were five of them originally. <laughs> if you'll turn to Ezekiel chapter number 28, we'll look at something in here that's quite remarkable. Ezekiel chapter number 28 and verse number 14. If you go back in verse number 11, you get the context of it, and you'll know for sure you're not talking about a man, because no man could fit this. Ezekiel 28 verse 11, Moreover the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say to him, All right, now we're addressing a human being. We're speaking far past that human being. Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Wait a minute. Yeah. Is this simply symbolical text? Or is this, am I to take this, am I to understand what it says here to be literal? How many, of you, how, how many would you take it to be literal? Amen. Well, that immediately eliminates the man. All right. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardis, topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day thou wast created. Now we're talking about a creature that was created. Now I'm a creature too, but I was born. Satan was not born. He was created. He was brought into existence. Now look at verse 14. Now watch this carefully. Thou art the anointed. You know what the, 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 the Hebrew word for anointed is? Mashiach. All right. What is Christ called in the Old Testament? Messiah. Mashiach is the Hebrew for Messiah. All right. Thou art the Messiah, cherub. The Mashiach, the anointed. The word Messiah means anointed, folks. Okay. It's like, it's like the word uh, uh, ecclesia, church. The Greek word ekklesia for the church is, is, is a called out assembly. It may be a called out assembly of drunks in the street passing out. And it's called an ekklesia. You've got to be careful with stuff like that. Just because the word is Mashiach doesn't necessar necessarily mean it's Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ. It is an anointed one. So Satan is an anointed one. This cherub is anointed. All right. The anointed cherub that covereth. That word covereth is a powerful statement because it's talking about his high rank. So what we have here is a Christ. We have a false Christ. But we have a Christ that is qualified from the very beginning to be a Christ. This is why the Bible says in the book of Psalms that the armies of the world, the people of the world, have, have, have risen up against the Lord and against His Christ. So if any man come unto you preaching another Jesus and you receive another spirit, so there's another Christ in the Bible. Yeah. You see how important that is? He is a Christ. He's a Christos. The Old Testament Hebrew word Mashiach is identical to the, to the, to the New Testament Greek word uh, Christos. All right, Mashiach and Christos. Mashiach, Messiah, Christos, Christ. 
So when we say the Lord Jesus Christ, we are saying Lord. That's because of His authority and rank. Jesus, that is the name that is above every name that can only save, the only name that can save. And then Christ is the anointing that God gave him when Peter said he hath anointed him. He anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and he went about doing good, healing the sick and raising the dead. He was anointed. And you've read the story of the anointing when the Holy Spirit came down as a dove. So you've got to be careful. The Bible's telling you, watch this. Watch this Christ, for he's another Christ. And be careful with him because he can cause you some trouble. So what does that do then? Well, it elevates this diablos, this devil, this wicked being, into a much higher plane. It raises him up into the world of glory, into the world of power, into the world of authority. It says that he's no longer this wicked, vile, uh, despicable, uh, contemptible thing that, that, that only tempts to, to, the, to the most vile and wicked of sins and raises him up on a plane that puts him right up in the very presence of God, if you please. And that's what it does. That's what Ezekiel's talking about. Now, look at a couple of things about Ezekiel. This is remarkable. Look at chapter number 1. Because Ezekiel deals with a cherubim in a very peculiar way. Chapter number 1, verse 10. Ezekiel 1, 10. Look at verse 5. Out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. And this was their likeness. They had the likeness of a man. Everyone had four faces. Everyone had four wings. Verse 10. As for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man, the face of a lion, the face of an ox, and the face of an eagle. Four faces. I read where four faces show up again in Ezekiel chapter number 10. Notice what it says in verse number 3. Now the cherubims now they're called cherubims, stood on the right side of the house. You continue on down verse number 14. Everyone had four faces. Here we go. The first face was the face of a cherub. The second face was the face of a man. The third face, the face of a lion. The fourth face, the face of an eagle. All right, now when you go to Revelation... You can go over there to chapter number 4 and verse number 7. You'll, fi you'll find what's called four living creatures. Now, what are these? These are cherubim. Where are they? They're around the very throne of God. Now, you've heard this said a thousand times. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the four Gospels. They give you the life of Christ. Each one of them is written for a specific purpose to give you a, perspe a, a, a specific perspective about Christ. Matthew obviously is the king, Mark's the servant, Luke is about the man, and then John <laughs> takes you back into eternity. So certainly you would find the face of an eagle, the one who soars above all the others. In the cherubim you have the face of a man, the face of a lion, the face of an ox, and the face of an eagle. All right. There's something peculiar going on in Ezekiel though. Something peculiar. If you remember what you read in chapter number 1 and compare it with what you read in chapter number 10, something changed. All right. All right. So the cherub is a what? Ox. All right. So the face of a cherub, it says in one place, is the face of an ox in another place. Now, what do you think the Brahmin handed down to the Buddhist, which developed into what's called Hinduism today, and Hinduism is one of those things that has perpetuated the caste system. And you know what the caste system is. If you don't know, it's a horrible thing because you're born into a certain way of life and you cannot get out of it. That's your karma. You live out your days in that caste system. And believe me, they make it bad and rough on people of a lower caste. But in any event, 
You can see today in India people starving to death, yet the cattle walk through the field. The cattle walk through the streets uh, untouched. Why? It's even come into the American language, the sacred cow. If you say sacred cow in America, what does that mean? What does that mean to an American? You've touched the sacred cow. In other words, you've touched the untouchable. You've crossed the line. You've gone too far. You don't touch the sacred cow. Are there sacred cows in America? You better believe it. If you've lived any time in this country, you'll know there are. They're not walking in the street, but the philosophy and ideology and doctrines here for sure. But in any event, in the book of Genesis, it says to the serpent, Now thou art cursed above all cattle. So a cow has a, has a, has a, uh, 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 you know, the leg of a cow is like, uh, for example, Baphomet. How many of you know what Baphomet is? Baphomet or Baphomet, Baphomet. If you have, if you don't know, it's an androgynous being. In plainer words, it is a male and female. It is the, con it is the conjunction of two beings brought together. All right. Why male, female? Yin, yang. Everything has to be complete within itself. It has to be brought together. All right? You have this bafflement. It has this leg. It has the lower part like a, like a, uh, pardon? Uh -huh. It has hoofs. All right? And uh, it has the, uh, it, is a, it, is the, it is the joining together of a human and an animal. Uh, down through history, you'll find a lot of this joining together of human an animal. Today they are experimenting in the labs of joining together the DNA of humans and animals. And they're, they're, they've opened Pandora's box and believe me they will open it. For the Bible says in the book of Genesis everything after its own kind. When God uh, sent those creatures on board that ark he only had to send one type of dog or a wolf which would perpetuate all the rest of the dog species that ever lived afterward. So it doesn't have to be anywhere near what a lot of people think. So when you, when you join the animal and human together, you'll find a lot of it in Assyria. You'll find a lot of it in Egyptian. Egy the Egyptian religion is loaded with it. It is the conjunction of the two. The reason for that is because you have a fallen angel, fallen angels that are directing the progress of mankind. They're giving mankind hidden wisdom, knowledge that man would never other, would, wouldn't find out any other way. This is why the Bible says in the book of Daniel, chapter number 12, that in the last days, knowledge will increase. You have seen an explosion of knowledge just in what's, you know, what was called the Industrial Revolution, the 1800s. Since then, you've seen what's happened, folks. For hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, basically nothing really changed. Men got around the same way century after century after century. And now, all of a sudden, you are living in an explosion of knowledge. Yeah. And when they discovered uh, DNA, uh, Crick and whoever the other fellow was with him back there, back in the what, 50s or 60s, somewhere in there, they discovered DNA, the double spiral helix. When they discovered that, they opened up a world that men did not even know existed. And now they're dealing with DNA. And they are receiving instructions, I believe, if you're not careful, you can be receiving instructions, spirit inspiration from the wrong place. And it's coming. And we're in the middle of it right now. We're already there. We're not looking at anything five or ten years down the road. You're in it. It's happening at this very minute. Stuff's going on that you just absolutely would blow your mind. Right. So DNA is a uh, is the is the is the thing that opened it all up, and of course that you know all the other stuff that's going on. This uh, it's called a, a, a I think it's a chimera. A chimera is the joining together of the animal and the human. Now the cherubim, these cherubim have the face of a man, the face of a lion, the face of an ox, and the face of an eagle. Now think about this for a minute. Were the cherubim made before God made the earth? Were they made before he made the animal creation? 
All right, then we have two possibilities. If a cherubim was made before God made the animal creation, and of course I think they were because I think all these angels and cherubim and seraphim and all the rest of them uh, were in existence. Uh, uh, if they were made beforehand, if they bore that image, then the face of a man, the face of a lion, the face of an ox and an eagle, before there was a man, a lion, an ox, and an eagle, what have you got going on here? Think about it. If you've got a creature that looks like a lion that has yet to exist, see, or an eagle that has yet to be created, or an ox that has yet to be created, then you've got something heading, you've got something going on. What you may very well have here is the Creator giving a preview of what He's about to do. How many following me here? <coughs> You've got the Creator giving a preview of what He's about to do. Folks, you know, I, I sometimes I just spend a little bit of time, I step back and crawl off in the corner somewhere, and I just kind of tremble when I think about Almighty God. I really do. I tremble when I think about, you're talking about, you're talking about a being that has all power, that knows everything. I'm talking about he's not a man like you are. And you need to get a hold of the majesty of God every once in a while. And let the glory of God flood your soul on occasion. Everything that exists came into being by him simply speaking the word. But he took the dirt that he spoke into existence and he made you. Yes, sir. Right. Of our God, and what are they doing? They are giving him perfect praise. Yes, they are. In Revelation, they are. He is worthy to be praised by God. Yes, sir. And to me, that, that is also something for us to look into and look upon and to realize the glory that we're going to be able to share yeah. to be there with those beings of old. Yes. From everlasting and everlasting in his presence. Yes. That glorious does matter. Yes, it Yes. 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 Yes, sir. Here's a great mistake that people make. This is a huge mistake. That you believe that just because it is an angel or a cherubim or a seraphim that they know everything. They don't know everything. They're creatures. And if you'll remember, the apostle talks about how that the angel, Peter did, he talked about how the angels desired to look into these things. See, they wanted to know them. And this is why the Bible says that when Christ was born, he came into this world. When that eternal, invisible being became a man, he said, let all the angels of God worship him. Now just think about that for a minute. Think about it. All of a sudden... Their creator became a man. And I'll say this again. I can't prove this one way or another, but I have a deep-seated feeling in my soul that nothing, I mean nothing, has ever seen that eternal being in his absolute essence. That is a privilege only for a privileged few. And the only way that you'll ever be brought to where you can ever see him in his essence, is through the Lord Jesus Christ. This is why the Bible says, no man knows the Father but the Son, no man knows the Son but the Father. One reveals the other to the other. The Son reveals you to the Father, the Father reveals you to the Son. You'll never know the Lord Jesus Christ until the Holy Spirit first comes to you and draws you to Christ. You'll never know God the Father until you've known Christ the Son who will take you to the Father. And that's the revelation. It's still bound up in revelation. Canst thou by searching find out God? No. You cannot, you cannot, you cannot find him out. And so it is, prob it is it's, it's, uh, it's uh, try to choose my word very carefully here, it is, it is uh, folly, pure folly for a creature, that's what I am, for a creature to think he has God figured out. It's folly. The best I can do is try to halfway figure out the sun. 
You know the churches are full of people that don't have a clue who the Lord Jesus is? They think he was a great prophet that came 2,000 years ago, had a good message, meant well, and died as a martyr on a cross, you know, and that he taught us how to live and, and, and gave us a lot of platitudes and blah, blah, and blah, blah, blah. They don't really understand. I talked to a dentist one time, and that dentist says, well, when God was in heaven and Christ was on the earth, he said, Christ was inferior to God who was in heaven. And so he says, there's no way that Christ could be God. See, that's, that's what you call logical reasoning. All right, is there anything wrong with that? That's right. the difference, preacher. All right. When God became a man, the man was subject to the same sufferings, sorrow, and death that we are so that he could become what we are so that we could become who he is. But that's a process. For when he came down to us, he came down into the territory of one who had a legal right to rule this earth, the devil. And he had to come face to face against Satan and legally defeat him on every point Satan could argue with him about, Christ Jesus the Lord legally defeated him. And then when he finally went to the cross, he made a show of him openly, Colossians says, and triumphed over them. And when he took that condemnation into himself, in Hebrews chapter number 5 it says that in the days of his flesh, with strong tears and crying, I can't remember exactly the wording, but he said he prayed to him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. He had come as far in obedience as he could possibly come. <laughs> he had borne in his body every sin every wicked, vile, corrupt sin of humanity. He had become sin for us who knew no sin. He could go no lower than where he was. And he cried at Gethsemane, for all of that had opened up in a blazing light right before his eyes. He knew what was coming. It was not the cross. It was not death on the cross at all because God did not deliver him from death on the cross. He died, but the scripture says here in Hebrews 5, he delivered him, he heard him in that he feared. He was able to deliver him from death and he heard him in that he feared. So what did he deliver him from? He delivered him from that moment when all of the condemnation of a holy righteous God in his wrath was poured out upon his son for the Lord Jesus Christ had become the sin offering, the scapegoat, the one who received in his body, in his body, in his body. And the Bible says in Hebrews, you should make his soul an offering for sin. Thou shalt see the travail of his soul. You'll hear his tears and you will be satisfied. It was paid in full. Absolutely. And when that moment came, and I cannot tell you exactly the moment where it was, but I can tell you this. He stopped him. And three days later, he raised him from the dead. And that's what he did for you. And that's what he did for me. During that time, he announced to those on the paradise side, those who had died in the arms of Abraham, the bosom of Abraham, those who had died before the flood, those who had died in the time of Noah after the flood, those who had died in faith, the sacrifice was finished. It's made. He delivered captivity, led captivity captive, gave gifts to men. That's what qualified him to be at the right hand of the Father as your great high priest. So the battle, while he was in the flesh, was against Satan. When he was dying in the spirit, he was in the hands of God. And so this is why the Bible says it's a fearful thing 
the Apostle Paul warns them in Hebrews 12, 29, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. If you're a born-again believer, you ought to get off somewhere and shudder and think, Lord God, thank you that I won't have to fall into the hands of the living God. For there's only one that can go past death, go past hell, go past the lake of fire. There's nowhere you can go to get past him and away from him. There is only one being that absolutely and completely controls every molecule of the universe. That's Almighty God. And there's nothing that anyone can do to get away from that one. So he saved him from death. Saved him from it. Now there's a lot of different takes on that scripture, but that's what's going on. Now the cherubim, the anointed cherub, the false Christ, pseudo Christos. The Greek word for false is pseudos. Pseudo. We use it in English language all the time. A pseudogram and so forth. Pseudos. It's everywhere. There's so many words the English language has that are taken from Greek, taken, we have some Hebrew words, taken from uh, Latin, you know, and all that. And it's a false Christ. A false Christ is a good, moral, uh, uh, religious Christ. But the true Christ will literally cut you free from mankind. Separate you from this world. Make you realize that you are no longer what you used to be. And give you the new birth and baptize you into the body of Christ. The real Christ will make a change in your life. Completely. Amen. All right. Well, I'm going to stop here. Got any questions? We'll take them now. And, uh, and we'll pick it up again next week. We'll go back to the cherubim for a little while and then move along. We'll get into the daimonion, the thing that uh, Plato talked about, the demon. Yes, ma'am. Well, there's different manifestation. You don't get, when you get off into the cherubim, you get into this. Like I say, before they ever made a, a, an eagle, before they ever made a lion, before they ever made, God ever made an ox, these creatures bore their identity. Okay? I think a cherubim, my personal belief about a cherubim, is that it, it is a witness to what God is going to do. That it's a creature that God made to be kind of like a... a uh, uh, I don't how, how would you say it? A creature that God manifests the future through. Maybe that would be a good way to put it. If you'll notice over there in Revelation, I mean in Ezekiel chapter number one, what are they doing? You've got a you've got a you've got a you've got a, a movable throne. Notice you got a man on that throne, and then what have you got on the throne? You got wheels. Then you got a wheel within a wheel. A wheel and a wheel is a what? It's a gyroscope. Right. I know. I know it. Uh, but the main thing about that in Ezekiel is that the book of Ezekiel is written, it's one of those captivity books. It's like the book of Daniel, and it's like the book of Zechariah. It's a book written about the cap during the time of the captivity when Israel is away from their country, away from their land, away from their king, away from their temple, and God is manifesting his sovereignty, his glory, letting them know, you might, you might not be at home, but I'm still the Lord. I'm still God. And that's, uh, that's what I think is going on there. Yes. Anybody else? Well, we have a word of prayer and we'll let you go then. It's 15 till. I've enjoyed being up here teaching. I've enjoyed it. This is a whole lot better than the emergency room. Amen. Amen. Lord right. God. <laughs> Brother Roger Lee, you dismiss it.
Lord Jesus is all about you. I pray, Heavenly Father, that the name of Jesus would be glorified in this place today. I pray you'd be lifted up in this house. Yes. Have your will and your way. We ask this in Jesus' precious.